Can you see that, Rashi? Is that okay? Yes, all good. Great, brilliant. We all well, it's set. for brilliant. It's four o'clock, everybody, and we'll start the 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 um the webinar. So thank you so much, for everybody joining. Um, Rashi and I, and um, Rashi, would you like to introduce introduce yourself as well? well <laughs> welcome, everyone. Great, and um. <laughs> I'm Bob Barber, I work as a psychiatrist in Newcastle and, and Rashi and myself will be chairing the webinar today. So a really warm welcome to everybody who's been able to, to, to join us. We're really delighted and excited about the webinar today. Um, so this is the second in a series of four. Um, we'll be meeting again, same place, same time on the 23rd and 30th of November um, for further webinars. And today we'll have two talks uh, followed by a Q&A session. If you can set your, um, we'll be using the chat function for any questions. So we'll be monitoring that. Um, so please feel free to ask ask questions. And if you can set your cameras and mics to off, that'd be really appreciated. It is organised by the faculty, but the speakers are expressing their own personal views. We will be recording the session with the aim of uploading that to the faculty website. Um, but please do not share slides without permission of the speakers. It's their property, and the meeting will end promptly at um, at five. So with today's focus is on Alzheimer's disease and fluid biomarkers, and this is a really exciting and rapidly changing area of, of, of clinical practice and diagnostics. So the insights and the windows we can look um, through through these biomarkers is, is, is changing. We can get closer to understanding the, the disease itself. We can potentially improve the precision of our diagnostic assessments. And in the context of DMTs, they will be more than likely, probably essential ultimately to determining who will be eligible for these medicines, um, we'll, we'll have to wait and see how much they're actually used for monitoring response to the new DMTs, but uh, they will be very, very closely involved in, in the, the eligibility. So we've got two, two talks today. Um, the first talk will look at the current use of clinical uh, biomarkers and CSF biomarkers. Then we'll take a look around the corner at what's coming in terms of blood biomarkers. It's a rapidly changing area. And then we'll go to speak with Ross Dunn about sort of setting up and accessing and developing the capacity, if you like, the infrastructure to deliver CSF biomarkers. So for our first speaker, I'm really delighted to be introducing uh, John Schott, who's Professor of Neurology at UCL and also Chief Medical Officer for AR UK. I know John didn't really want us to do uh, much of an introduction, but I think it's fair to say that um, in a nutshell, he is an sort of international opinion leader in this area. So we're, we're delighted he's able to, to share uh, his insights and knowledge on this topic today. So I'll, I'll hand over to, to John now. Thank you, John. Thank you very much indeed for the, the extremely kind introduction. Can I just make sure that um, you can, um, sorry, I need to make sure I can share my slides properly. Um, can I just make sure that you can see see my slides here? Yes, yeah, you can. Just going on to, yeah. To sorry, I realise, I'm sorry, I've got a slight issue here. Apologies for just, just one second whilst I just um, sort this out again. Apologies. I'm going to, I'm not quite sure what's going on here, but we'll start from here. So yes, again, apologies fantastic. for the glitches. I think we're up and running now. So thank you very much. I'm going to give you an overview of fluid-based biomarkers around current practice and future directions, mainly around CSF, but I'll touch on the new exciting developments in blood as well. So let's just start off by defining a biomarker. Diet biomarkers is a defined characteristic which is a measurement of, an, of a normal biological process, a pathogenic process, or a response to an exposure or, or an intervention. Um, in uh, in uh, sorry, I'm not being asked about captions and subtitles. Um, uh, and therefore, it's to inform diagnosis, prognosis, for use in clinical trials or in natural history studies. But um, for our purposes, we're really interested in in diagnosis. So everybody will on this uh, call will be aware that dementia is a syndrome and not a diagnosis, um, and that these are the main reason, the main causes of dementia are the neurodegenerative diseases, but there's clearly a close out overlap uh, with vascular disease as well. When it comes to the neurodegenerative diseases, whilst these have characteristic clinical phenotypes, they're defined by their pathologies, the Lewy bodies, that we see of cell nuclein in DLB, the plaques and tangles of Alzheimer's disease, tauopathies or disorders of TDP 
43 uh, as well. And it's those uh, protein abnormalities that define the diseases. And what we think is occurring is you're having protein misfolding uh, with and accumulation, which spreads through vulnerable networks, leads to neuronal loss, neuroinflammation, atrophy, so actually loss of brain tissue, hypermetabolism, and that leads to the clinical manifestations. And the different proteins have different tropisms for different cell types, different networks, which leads to the fairly reliable clinical manifestations uh, for which we uh, base our, 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 our diagnoses. The issue is that um, if we just take a clinical diagnosis, then the actual accuracy for detecting the underlying pathologies, say of Alzheimer's disease, plaques and tangles, is really quite low. So this is data from um, the Alzheimer's centers in the US when before biomarkers were being used. So these are still expert Alzheimer's centers. And you can see that in 526 people who were diagnosed with clinically probable Alzheimer's disease, 427 went on to have autopsy. And those who had a, a, a clear Alzheimer's disease, Brock stage five or six, we had a sensitivity of about 77% and a specificity of about 60% for detecting the underlying pathology. So I'm afraid to say that as clinicians, if we go on our gut judgment, even with the best clinical criteria, we are giving people the wrong diagnosis, a minimum of 25% of time if we're telling them they've got Alzheimer's disease and we're missing a lot of cases as well. So if we look at this scheme and we're saying that it's the pathologies that define the diseases and we're starting with the clinical manifestations, increasingly what we want to do is to turn this flow chart the other way around and be able to detect the misfolded proteins that are accumulating in the brain in order to provide a molecular diagnosis. Now this needs to be mapped onto the clinical diagnosis of course but this adds on a degree or an additional degree of sensitivity and specificity around the diagnosis. It also in due course not currently but allows us to think about preclinical disease and prodromal states such that we can make a more confident diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease when patients have isolated memory problems, such as um, uh, we see in MCI. Why does this matter? Well, accurate diagnosis matters now. Our patients want an accurate diagnosis. We can counsel them better. We can give them appropriate treatments now, even if uh, in, in the current state of play. So I'm a great believer that we need to diagnose people accurately, but this is going to change very dramatically when we think about new treatments for Alzheimer's disease. Whether or not this gets licensed or, or get through, through, through NICE, we are at a turning point. So we now have um, several different drugs, um, two leading candidates, lecanemab, which are showing uh, significant uh, changes and um, slowing of cognitive impairment and very dramatic um, decline in the amyloid load in the brain as measured in this case using the PET scans. And similar results here in Donanumab, again showing significant cognitive slowing and dramatic depletion of amyloid within the brain. Importantly, um, an entry criteria, as Bob was saying for these studies, and undoubtedly will be for clinical practice, is demonstration of Alzheimer pathology within the brain. We don't want to be treating the people that are misdiagnosed with these powerful medications, which they won't uh, benefit from. And we need to make sure that we're offering these medications to those um, who might benefit. So if we think about molecular biomarkers, I'm gonna very much have a focus on Alzheimer's disease because this is the area which is uh, already uh, most developed we clearly, everyone here will know that the core pathologies of Alzheimer's disease are accumulation of amyloid plaques within the brain. Uh, tau pathology within neurons are comprised of phosphor hyperphosphorylated tau and neurodegeneration or brain volume loss as seen in the left slice of this brain compared to the normal uh, brain on the right. Um, we, can, we can detect these using uh, imaging technologies, amyloid PET, Tau PET and MRI, but we can also do so using CSF. So CSF A beta 42 and to 40 as a measure of amyloid pathology, CSF phosphorylated tau as a member of tau pathology, and CSF total tau, neurofilament light, and possibly um, glyophobrillary acidic protein GFAP for neurodegeneration. Um, we can also um, 
just to show that we can, of course, measure amyloid plaques within the brain using commercially available amyloid PET uh, traces, of which there are three, of which only one really is, 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 is in use in this country. And of course, very, very few people receive amyloid PET traces. It's not on nice guidance um, and they're um, expensive and, and difficult uh, to access. So what can we measure in the core CSF biomarkers for Alzheimer's disease? So as we said, we can measure uh, amyloid and we tend to measure A-beta 42, which is the shorter pathological form of A-beta. And that's best expressed as a ratio. So a ratio of A-beta 42 to 40. A-beta 40 doesn't change with Alzheimer's disease, but does correct for variability um, between individuals. And A B to 42 to 40 ratio declines in Alzheimer's disease. We think that the plaques are, are maintained within the brain. So this decreases the A B to 40 to 42 ratio that we can detect in CSF. Phosphorylated tau is around uh, double, tau, uh, total tau is around double, and neurofilament light is around double that seen in controls. Importantly, phosphorylated tau, I think, is specific for Alzheimer's disease. Total tau um, is relatively specific, but it's also seen in other conditions after um, severe head injury in CJD and so forth. And neurofilament light is non-specific and is elevated in most conditions with neurodegeneration, either in, within the central or peripheral nervous system. And just an importance about interpreting CSF markers, um, I, I help run the CSF service at Queen Square with the National Reference Laboratory um, and quite frequently get queries about interpretation of CSF biomarkers and it's very very important and we'll hear from Ross about this late, later that the samples are correctly taken stored in the correct tubes and processed appropriately and in particular one needs to use polypropylene tubes to measure these um, analytes the CSF amyloid in particular is extremely sticky and will stick to the tubes, which will artificially lower the levels and therefore give a potential false positive. As with any biomarker, you need to have cut points which are defining what's normal and abnormal. And this is not a straightforward process. Sampling errors are possible. There's different platforms for measuring these biomarkers, different kits. And some healthy individuals will have preclinical Alzheimer's disease. We think Alzheimer's disease starts 10 plus years before symptoms emerge, and we can start detecting these within the brain. And then there's a question about what's the gold standard. The gold standard should be autopsy, which clearly isn't available uh, in all but a very selected centers, amyloid PET. So to know what the positivity and, and uh, is, it's not straightforward, and we need to balance sensitivity and specificity. So just to touch on a few of these points, which are really important when it comes to interpretation, is a knowledge that a significant proportion of healthy elderly people will have amyloid pathology in the brain without necessarily having symptoms. So here we have age and we have the prevalence of amyloid pathology. So you can see this is around 10% in your 50s, but creeps up to about 20% by your 60, 65, 25% by 75. And if you lift the age of 90, about 40 percent of people will have amyloid pathology within the brain. Now, we think that what this means is that we're detecting preclinical disease and that the people who are accumulating amyloid in their 50s may well be on a path to developing Alzheimer's disease within the next 10 or 15 years, although we don't know that for certain. But it's important that we recognize that if you go and do lumbar punctures or amyloid PET scans or blood tests, on healthy elderly individuals who will detect a proportion who will have amyloid positivity within the brain. So I'm going to debate about whether these people should be defined as having Alzheimer's disease, but in the context of what we're talking about, which is in your clinical practice, you need to be aware that um, the, the presence of amyloid pathology is necessary, but not sufficient for a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. When it comes to interpreting the CSF biomarkers, what we ideally want is a bimodal distribution when you've got true negative people who are healthy on one side and true positive people who are, uh, have the disease on the other side, and you'd have a perfect cut point. But you always have some degree of overlap with some false positives and false negatives, and you need to make a decision about where to put that cut point. 
And so this is actually a graph of, of CSFA beta 42 levels from um, a large public available data set. And this contains controls, patients with MCI and Alzheimer's disease. And you can see that there is a bimodal distribution here, but we'll have to decide roughly where the cut point is here. And the take home message here is that if you have a cut point, then it's not some magic number when if you creep very slightly above or below, it's either positive or negative. These are biological processes. We think everyone's starting from here and shifting this direction. So like any test, like a blood test, like a scan, this needs to be taken in the clinical context rather than an absolute diagnosis itself. And ultimately what this comes down to, and this is, I think, the most important slide in all of biomarker uh, research and clinical practice, is whether you are more concerned about a type 1 error, a false positive, or a type 2 error. And that depends a lot on the clinical context. If you are doing a screening test, then you might want to try and detect everybody who might be positive and try and minimize false negatives before you might do a definitive test. So, for example, in bowel screening, you might do a fecal local blood uh, test um, when there's going to be lots of false positives. And then you do your colonoscopy, which is more invasive to stop having false negative tests. So we need to think about that when we interpret BLURM CSF tests. And things are much more difficult in some other biomarkers. So this is the, the tau concentration that I showed you, the amyloid one for, and you can see there's no clear cut point here. So you need then to think about what metrics you're going to use to try and define your cut point, to define sensitivity and specificity. So what tests are now available? So I say at the National Reference Laboratory um, at, at Queen Square, when we receive CSF samples from over 100 centers, um, around the country. Um, this is an accredited, UCAS accredited laboratory. Um, you can uh, go onto their website and you can uh, see the timelines and how to take these tests and be in contact with the lab and send your tests there. Um, you can see that these are the core mile markers that we use, which are the AB to 42 to 40 ratio uh, and the cut points of that is a normal should have greater than 0.065. Phosphorylated tau, the normal range is less than 61. There's an age-related range in neurofilament light because that increases with age. And tau, which we don't use so often in isolation now, and that's a normal range there. As I've said, it's absolutely vital these are taken appropriately. They need to be taken polypropylene tube, tubes. They need to be centrifuged and sent frozen at minus 80. And there's around a two week turnaround time for these tests. I'm not going to touch on how to set up clinics and take samples because Ross Dunn will be um, covering that in great detail. Um, but those of you with cameras, if you'd like to take a photo of this QR code, this will take us to um, a, a paper that we authored in Practical Neurology, which is open access, which talks all around CSF biomarkers for dementia. And I think it was fair to say that Ross used this in setting up his service as well, thinking about how to set up a service, how to do the biomarker, how to do the lumbar punctures, um, how to interpret them, um, the results and so forth with some case studies as well. So that may be useful. How and when should we use uh, the CSF biomarkers? Well, nice guidance, which remember is for dementia only, despite our best experts, we don't have, we don't have guidance yet for, for, for MCI. It says that all individuals being investigated for dementia should have structural imaging. And then you should consider further tests to diagnose a dementia subtype. For Alzheimer's disease, this can be an FTG PET scan or a SPECT. To my mind, this is an injury biomarker, so it's very similar to what you're going to get from an MRI scan or the CSF measures of tau, phosphatau, and AB to 42 or the beta B to 42-40 ratio. This is different. This is a molecular diagnostic. Um, so these two are not equivalent to one another. For DLB, we can use DAT scans or MIBG cardiac scans and FTD. Uh, FDG, PET, and SPECT. So the real best evidence here is for Alzheimer's disease to try and rule in or rule out Alzheimer's pathology. In terms of good use criteria, just to compare and contrast amyloid PET and CSF, both are licensed, both the good use criteria suggest that these can be used for unexplained patients with MCI, atypical Alzheimer's or young onset Alzheimer's disease. CSF 
It suggested that you probably can use for typical late onset Alzheimer's disease and possibly subjective impairment. I think the real reason for not using this in later onset Alzheimer's disease is because of the increasing prevalence of amyloid pathology in healthy elderly. However, this will change dramatically if this is required as an inclusion criteria for uh, new disease modifying therapies. Comparing, contrasting the two, I do a lot of research using both of these modalities, so trying to be as unbiased as possible. PET scan is much more expensive uh, than CSF, probably around one and a half to two thousand pounds a scan, whereas CSF is probably around 300 or thereabouts. PET scans require a radiation uh, dose, um, they require specialist facilities um, and PET tracer. Uh, CSF is limited by anticoagulation. We're happy to do lumbar punctures in people with aspirin, uh, but not in, 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 in when they have on anticoagulants. About 10% of people get a headache with a CSF examination, or that's smaller in patients um, with dementia, um, and is actually very manageable, particularly with careful counselling. You get a CT scan if you do a PET scan, but if you do a CSF, you can measure cells, protein, glucose, oligoclonal bands, and a vast array of other um, um, uh, analytes now, including RT Quick, currently for prion disease, and due course for dementia with Lewy bodies. There are huge numbers of other markers in research, and you can store your samples uh, for future testing. I thought it might be helpful just to show a few cases to describe how. Um, we might use these. These are all patients that I have uh, seen. I tend to see a slightly more unusual array of, of patients in my clinic at Queen Square, but I think hopefully this will give you uh, a flavour. So this was a 58-year-old lady who was sent to me with several years of cognitive decline. She was getting lost, confused, and she was very amnestic. She was a smoker, she was hypertensive, and she drank a very large amount of alcohol, certainly in the past and probably recently. She also had congenital deafness, and when I saw her, she was extremely amnestic, had some subtle parietal signs, and very hard of hearing. She had an MRI scan, which I think shows some generalized atrophy. Hippocampi are probably slightly small, but so is the rest of the brain, a bit of ventricular uh, enlargement as well. So I was left with the conundrum whether this was all related to Alzheimer's disease, whether this was related to alcohol use, or whether there was some unusual presentation with her congenital deafness. Uh, she went on to have a CSF examination, which did not show any evidence for infection uh, or inflammation. She had matched oligoclonal bands, which is of uncertain significance. But she had a very low ratio of AV to 42 to 40. She had an extremely elevated phosphate tau level and an elevated neurofilament light level. So she had evidence of amyloid, tau, and neurodegeneration. And on that basis, she was diagnosed with young onset Alzheimer's disease, and she was treated with appropriate medications and counseling. The second case is a 77-year-old lady who presented to me with a five-year history of cognitive decline centered on memory, no past medical or family history, a mini mental of 22 out of 30, Neuropsychology, which had showed impaired memory more for verbal than visual material, but also naming problems and disexecutive, so multi domain, cognitive slowing with normal parietal functioning and a normal EEG. She had this MRI scan, shows rather large ventricles and possibly slightly small hippocampi, but this lesion here, which was thought to represent a meningioma. So the question was is this related to the meningioma or is this uh, Alzheimer's disease or is it both? noting that the meningioma is on the left hemisphere, so it might account for the verbal more than visual memory problems. After ensuring there was no safety aspects, it, with regards to the lumbar puncture, one needs to be careful, of course, with mass lesions. She had a CSF, which showed normal protein and normal glucose, a borderline level um, of A beta 42. Again, just stressing that with these ranges one needs to be a little bit careful about. She had an, uh, a normal level of total tau. This was before you were doing 42 to 40 ratio. Um, she had a phosphorylated tau concentration, which was within the normal range of 22. So on this basis, it was thought unlikely that she had an Alzheimer's disease. And actually, that it was more likely that the meningioma was affecting her cognition. And she was therefore referred uh, to the neurosurgeons for consideration of treatment. She went actually on to have an amyloid PET scan so we can see here that we can't see any uptake here around the meningioma, but this amyloid PET scan is negative. We see the normal branching structure here, which is just in the white matter. So this lady does not have Alzheimer's disease as a cause of her illness. 
The third case is a 62-year-old lady who was previously highly functioning. She developed episodic memory impairment over a couple of years, past issue of thyroid and breast cancer, both in remission with no family history. She had relatively mild impairments with a mental of 28 out of 30, but she had neuropsychological testing revealing quite a decline in her performance IQ with evidence for impaired recall and recognition for both words and faces, mild decreased executive functioning and some cognitive slowing. So definite memory and other domains impacting on her activities of daily living, probably. This is her MRI scan, which was reported as normal. She went on to have a CSF examination, which revealed that she had low levels of AB to 42, again, before we were doing uh, the ratio, um, slightly elevated total tau and elevated phosphor tau. And on that basis, she was diagnosed with mild Alzheimer's disease, and she was started on Dimepazil. And shortly afterwards, she was recruited to the aducanumab trial, um, which uh, has, uh, she was uh, in 2016, one of the uh, monoclonal antibodies, uh, the rock, rather uh, more controversial uh, antibody. Um, and uh, she, as part of this, she had an amyloid PET scan, which is very positive. So you can see here that the cortex is all uh, blurred, and this is the amyloid accumulation. Um, there's some interest in this in this in this case. We know that she was on um, an active treatment um, because she developed ARIA, which is amyloid-related imaging and, and abnormalities. Um, although it was asymptomatic, and so the, the medication was stopped and, and then started, and she still continues in an open label study today. And what's remarkable about this lady is that this is her mini mental state scores. Um, I've been seeing her now, and her mini mental now is still 27 um, out of 30. Um, and she uh, is definitely amnestic, but um, is uh, still going strong and spending time with her young grandson. Uh, um, this is a case that I firmly believe um, we've modified the effect, the course of her illness uh, through amyloid immunotherapy, which only made possible by starting her on medication. Uh, this QR code, if you're interested, will take you to a video of this lady who is described when I'm examining her and describing her, her symptoms. It's on YouTube. She took part in a, in a symposium on disease modifying therapies. Um, but may give you an example of how disease modifying therapies we think may affect individuals and the rationale for these sorts of um, diagnostic approaches. Finally, it's just to say that there are new clinical criteria for Alzheimer's disease, as people will know, um, and uh, research criteria as well. But these are now incorporating biomarkers and allowing for a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease in the mild cognitive impairment stage. And just to say how I think this may be used in, in, in the future um, is to try and prognosticate. We're all seeing patients with mild cognitive impairment, however we might describe them. And what we really want to know is what's going to happen to those individuals because patients diagnosed with MCI, around 50% will uh, not have proceeded to dementia within a five-year period. And so this study tries to put together an, an algorithm using different biomarkers. And so a 62-year-old man with MCI and, M, and, and MMOC of 27 has got an a priori probability of progression to dementia of 26% in three years and 40% in five years. But if his, hippocamp, if his phosphor tau, A beta and hippocampal volumes are normal, then this reduces to 5% within three years and 8% in five years. So a clear example about how we might use these, med, these uh, new technologies to help us prognosticate to our patients. And I think it also reinforces something that I'm a firm believer is that we overestimate a positive biomarker, but we definitely underestimate a negative biomarker. Someone who doesn't have amyloid and tau within the brain does not have Alzheimer's disease. So I'd like to touch briefly around blood-based biomarkers, which is clearly lots of excitement. Um, and until around 2018, um, a series of studies, and these are forest plots showing effect sizes, were incredibly um, disappointing. You just could not uh, get a signal from those. But things have changed dramatically in recent years. This has really come through new technologies, the SIMO, a single molecule analyzer, mass spectrometry, the LumiPulse technology, which I've indicated before, uh, and just the sensitivity that these have. So um, if, if you uh, dissolved a gram of salt in a thousand trillion liters of water, the SIMOA could detect it. 
and the mass spectrometer can detect a gram of salt uh, dissolved in a million trillion liters of water. So these are unbelievably sensitive bits of uh, equipment, which are now allowing us to have blood tests for Alzheimer's uh, disease. This is clearly very, very timely. This is from the Times this morning, uh, and this is from ARUK Alzheimer's Society um, uh, initiative to try and um, test blood tests, bar biomarkers in, in NHS memory uh, clinics. So just to give some examples of these, so the first off the blocks has been neurofilament light. And just to show that neurofilament light in the CSF and blood correlate extremely closely. Um, you can measure this very easily in blood. Um, it's, however, non-specific for etiology. It generally predicts the intensity of neurodegeneration, but is not specific for Alzheimer's disease. It is, however, elevated prior to symptoms in patients uh, with familial Alzheimer's disease. And in MS, is now being used um, uh, to, as a metric of disease activity for response to treatment and relapses. In terms of plasma beta amyloid, these would mainly be measured using mass spectrometry, but also the SIMOA, again, this ratio of AB to 42 to 40, and with areas under the curve of around 0.8 compared to PET. Original studies from Nakamura in 2018, and then lots of other studies since. There are now um, tests that are available, FDA tests um, in, in, in the US using the Precipity and Quest diagnostics. However, the real excitement, I think, from the field comes with plasma phosphorylated tau. This is a round robin study we ran from Gothenburg and at UCL testing all of these different technologies um, against CSF. Um, and you can see that virtually all of them have an error under the curve of 0.8. The phosphorylated tau 217 in particular, are ones in blue, are all performing at an incredibly high level up to 95, 98% um, uh, errors under the curves with extremely high sensitivity and specificity for detecting Alzheimer's pathology. And phosphorylated tau actually has a combination. It picks up some amyloid pathology and phosphorylated tau. So it's a marker of Alzheimer's disease related pathologies in general. It's very sensitive and specific for Alzheimer's versus controls. Alzheimer's versus other neurodegenerative disease. It's elevated before symptoms start. It predicts progression. It correlates with amyloid and tau PET. It can be measured using widely available instruments. So there's the potential to roll this out across the country. There's some questions about how it performs in diverse populations, which needs further assessment. And there's some issues around comorbidities. It is elevated with high body mass index and renal impairment. These need to be taken into account. How might these be used? Well, there's various studies which are looking at these at the moment, but a general consensus is that you'll have patients with cognitive symptoms, you'll do a plasma phosphor tau level, and you need to think about carefully about the clinical assessments and caution with comorbidities, make sure you're taking the samples properly. But the evidence seems to be that in around 80% of people, you'll be able to give, assign people either a very high probability or a very low probability of having Alzheimer pathology. Those with high probability, you can almost certainly confidently diagnose with Alzheimer's disease pathology, and you can think about and new treatments and symptomatics, low probability. You need obviously to consider whether they've got other forms of dementia um, before reassuring, and there'll be 20 to 30% in that gray zone, which probably reflects reality, and those might be the ones who will need a CSF or possibly a PET scan. There are appropriate use recommendations for blood-based biomarkers. At the moment, pre-screening for clinical trials, exploratory outcomes for clinical trials should only be used in symptomatic patients and at the moment confirmed by CSF or PET as well, although um, it's very much suggested that there are ongoing clinical trials to assess whether they can be used in isolation. We're hoping to carry one of these out shortly. Shouldn't be used standalone or in primary care at the moment pending trials. Caveats for molecular biomarkers, I think, just to finish up with, they need clinical interpretation. These are not diagnostic tests for Alzheimer's disease. They're diagnostic tests for the presence of amyloid pathology within the brain, which will be positive in a proportion of healthy elderly. These study in different populations. 
And as I've alluded to before, I think the role of negative biomarkers may be as if not more useful than those that are positive. I'm preaching to the choir here when I say that dementia almost always has multiple pathologies, particularly in the elderly. We need to consider vascular disease. We are getting good biomarkers for prion disease. Now these are available and part of diagnostic criteria using RT-QUIC in the CSF alpha synuclein is coming soon and will be available at Queen Square shortly. And we don't have these yet for frontotemporal dementia pathologies, especially TDP43. No biomarker is diagnostic. We need standardization, quality control, and cut points. So I'll finish there. I'd like to thank all of the all of my funders, my collaborators um, in uh, the labs um, who make all of this work uh, possible. And thank you very much for your attention. And hope I haven't gone too over time, Bob. No, absolutely perfect. Thanks, John. And Rashi is going to introduce Ross now. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for that. And know you'll be around for some questions. So thank you. Thank you, Bob. Uh, what a fantastic talk. You know, I, I, I couldn't even sort of realize that, 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 that the time is just running, really. So we are nearly there. OK, but without wasting any further time, I'm going to hand you over to Ross, who is going to talk about uh, setting up lumbar puncture services um, in your in your clinical areas, in your, you know, uh, in your trust. So over to you, Ross. Rashi, can you hear me OK? Yes, we can. OK, good. Just I'm, 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 I apologize to everybody. I'm sitting in a hotel room, so I hope the uh, Internet holds out. And um, this is going to be a very brass tacks talk about how I got a service set, set up and running inside a UK mental health trust. Um, and running might be a stretch, but it, we are actually um, seeing patients and getting uh, um, CSF based diagnostics on them. Um, so. Uh, the thing to emphasize is, I suppose I'm not in a biomedical research center. I'm not a professor of anything. Um, I don't even have a PhD. Uh, Manchester is not a particularly um, um, amazing trust. We're currently um, being stalked by the CQC and, and NHS England. And we work in estates which date back to the late 1960s, early 1970s. Um, so uh, if it can be done here, it probably can be done in your nice trust. Um, and uh, I won't be taking any excuses. I'm not that special. I'm a jobbing old age psychiatrist. I do supervise some clinical trials. I initially trained in Dublin as a core trainee, then did some higher training in Cambridge with John O'Brien and uh, chose a consultant position in Manchester because I missed the rain and the urban decay, really. Um, I did uh, ECT for a while, did some research in ECT, and so was no sort of um, uh, stranger to procedures and uh, working with anaesthetists and things like that. Um, what, I, what I did bring with me from Ireland was a, a kind of a, a frustration, anger with the state of clinical diagnosis that we would be telling people who maybe our guts said did in fact have a neurodegenerative disease that we simply didn't know because they weren't impaired enough. Uh, and we were doing these pen and paper tests that gave us scores out of 100 and lots of people scored over 85 and we were left shrugging our shoulders and, and hopefully following them up. Um, so, you know, if we think about it, six, about 20% of people in UK mental health trusts present with a mild cognitive impairment. Um, that, that means by definition, there's three to four years to a, an even slightly definitive diagnosis. Um, even if, even with what John had just presented to you, the Thomas Beach paper that demonstrates that we're, we're wrong 30% of the time. I also carry with me a little bit of a chip on my shoulder about asking neurologists for help. I'm going to be honest. Um, I'd like to be able to do most of this myself. And um, I also know um, that the, the behavioural neurologists that there are around the UK are absolutely snowed under permanently. Um, they're all academic, academically brilliant, but they won't, will, will not be able to, to handle increases that are going to be associated with the development of any disease modifying therapy. Um, and the other useful thing for lumbar punctures is a set of opposable thumbs. Um, and basically, if you have a set of opposable thumbs, you can do a lumbar puncture. You'll be glad to hear. Um, this is the kind of um, uh, memory clinic setup that most of us are used to. Uh, we've kind of accepted this over many years. It's what I call the tin shed memory clinic. It's, uh, it's not quite made of tin. It could be made of corrugated iron or chipboard or whatever you like. Um, the idea has been that we've been able to, you know, do a memory clinic by getting people to copy a clock on the back of an envelope um, in, the, in the dingy corner of some uh, district general hospital. Um, and that's, that's what constitutes a memory clinic. And hopefully we're starting to um, uh, to see that actually that's not going to be fit for purpose and um, that we're going to be a, we're going to have to be able to see our own scans, going to have to be able to read our own scans um, and we're going to have to um, 
significantly improve on that 70% uh, if we're going to be rolling out very serious monoclonal antibodies in, in uh, people with neurodegenerative diseases. So about four years ago, we started to try to make the case in Manchester. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about how I, how I did it. Um, uh, you can look up how to do a lumbar puncture procedure. I don't think that's particularly useful, but I want to tell you how you do it inside an organization that is low on resources, low on interest, um, where you don't particularly have a hook and, and what the arguments might be in, in terms of getting an actual service up and running. Um, so my experience tells me that you really have to want it. If you don't want this, you're not going to be able to convince anybody else. And finding the right people inside your own trust, your own manager, their manager, um, somebody perhaps on the physical health committee, somebody who is a, a dual trained nurse. These kinds of people can be quite useful. Um, I had very good political cover from the medical director who for years was uh, an old age psychiatrist. Um, make the case to your colleagues initially. Um, and that can be a few case presentations. It could be something like this webinar. Um, it could be the symposium that John just put up a link to, uh, which was an excellent symposium um, a few months ago in London. And just kind of try and, that dreadful American word, try and socialize people to the idea that this is coming. This is a test that, that could add to their practice. Um, I made it very clear within the trust that this was a pilot and that significantly lowered anxieties, I, I think, for everybody concerned. There was a possibility then that it would eventually go away and Dr. Dunn would stop pestering them about, uh, about the need for this service. Um, of course, that's not true, but it's nice to let people um, think it, it might be true. Um, and I've always found that putting the patient at the center of the argument makes the argument um, uh, unlosable. So if you can argue from a patient's point of view, and in fact get patients active in advocating for the availability of a particular diagnostic, that, that has been particularly um, uh, successful and impactful for us. Um, do talk to patient and care groups. These people happily talk to you. You can take a straw poll or you can get um, testimony from them, get them to write to people if necessary to get, to get the adequate resource in place. And um, the arguments that I made to try and get the trust to pay attention were things like uh, this is nice guidance from 2016. That's uh, seven, you know, seven years down the line, we still haven't uh, implemented. And actually, uh, that's a healthcare inequality because it will be done in an acute trust. And in fact, it's being done in acute trust. Um, this is being done elsewhere. So this is a postcode lottery, which is a healthcare inequality. Uh, my patients, just because they're northern or not near UCL or because they're less well off, um, they shouldn't be discriminated against. So that's a healthcare inequality. Um, and then, of course, we have the fact that you'll know that people who come through your memory uh, assessment service who uh, have uh, less than average literacy, who for whom English is not their first language, for whom you're maybe doing testing tr through a translator, or who have comorbidities like major mental illnesses, those people don't give you a clear answer um, on uh, neuropsychological testing and clinical history, and the, and the, 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 the diagnostic can, can, the diagnosis can be muddy for a significant amount of time, and those people will significantly benefit from the availability of these CSF biomarkers. So that in itself, again, is a healthcare inequality. And you can see the theme here, um, uh, trying to generate a little bit of momentum around this, demonstrating that people actually will benefit from it. So I wrote a copy um, uh, of a policy and then expanded it significantly um, to make sure that it had everything that a mental health trust would want in it, um, the training procedures, governance around it, who was responsible for the unit, um, uh, how we would train up new people, the use of ultrasound for um, uh, demonstrating the anatomy when necessary, um, and just made it basically impossible for it to be poked holes in. And I can say that my colleagues were very, very helpful. Um, uh, my colleague Tobias Lang Heinrich out in Salford was very helpful uh, reading through that and, and giving me pointers. Um, you need to really know what you're talking about. So you need to read around the, the literature, that, some of which John has put in front of you. Um, and we've set up a rolling audit of patient experience of these uh, procedures so that they have um, an ability to feed back into the system uh, and then get trained. And to get trained, really what you need to do is find somebody in your local area who is doing the procedure on a regular basis. Now, that may be a consultant neurologist, but it's probably not because they, they mostly send people off to a day hospital to have things done. So for me in Salford, it was um, an advanced nurse practitioner in neurosurgery who was hugely helpful. Um, and I behaved like a diligent medical student, would turn up at half eight, set up the trolleys for the, for the procedures that day and help them. Um, and as we went through, of course, I got a chance to do some of the procedures. And when I'd done 10, I felt I was able to do them on my own pretty much. But having that logbook and being able to show people that yes, this was previously outside your scope of practice, but it's now well inside your scope of practice, that reassures people. 
And you know, um, this uh, it doesn't all go perfectly. Um, you'll get you'll miss one. You might miss two. Uh, patients can be very large, and that requires a bit of experience. Um, and you just keep going until you you uh, get the knack of it. And it really is a knack. This is not a complex um, procedure by any means. And uh, at the, and once you've managed your own anxiety around it, then it's very doable indeed. Um, I found that prior to being prior to being able to do this myself and having having the clinic, patient patients were very reluctant when you spoke to them about it. But actually, having an open kit in front of you, having a plastic spine beside you on the desk, um, explaining the whole procedure, explaining what we've done in terms of um, changing the the material we use. So we now use blunt needles, these sort of um, uh, more like a darning needle needle um, than the sharp cutting needles that were previously used. I demonstrate the needle, I get them to handle it so that they can see that it's a very um, a spindly, um, non-threatening kind of an object. And we talk honestly then about, you know, how many I've done in the last six months, what the complications have been. Um, and I always emphasize the possibility of equivocal results, even though um, this is the most definitive thing people basically can have. So I'll do that in the office and then I will reconsent people on the day of the procedure. We do them on a Friday morning in the electroconvulsive therapy recovery area. Why here? Well, um, there is lots of things that ECTAS, the accreditation service for ECT suites and across the mental health trust, say that you have to have. You have to have this recovery area. You have to have a waiting room. You have to have resource equipment. You have to have privacy. And generally speaking, there's quite an underutilized space in most trusts. So most trusts will do ECT Monday, Thursday or Tuesday, Friday. Um, uh, but the other uh, three mornings a week, it's uh, it's lying fallow or it's being used for clos clozapine clinics or other things. You really should be doing these um, lumbar punctures for CSF biomarkers in the morning. There's a diurnal variation in amyloid in the cerebrospinal fluid. Um, but there's uh, an obvious opportunity here for us to take advantage of existing infrastructure um where uh, for example the acute trust can't take up the slack and you know, there is various pieces of equipment if you're an early adopter that you need um i needed to buy a uh, minus 80 freezer in the christmas sales literally to avoid uh, some procurement procedures within the trust um a small centrifuge uh, these can be bought or leased from clinical trials companies um, and again that's kind of an early adopter tax and um, because as we go along we'll see that some of the the assays um uh, are now available for for sort of mass production across district general hospitals. That brings its own problems, but we're hoping to be able to to lower the energy of access for people who are are maybe not in the university centre. However, a good local laboratory, if you have friends in the acute trust and you can make friends in the laboratory directorate, and um, then you may be able to just give them a sample um, instead of doing things like pipetting and freezing yourself, which I can tell you gets gets old pretty quickly. So people always ask me how did I fund the pilot, um, and uh, probably the best uh, example I can give you is this uh, front page in, of the New Yorker, a pickpocket's tale. Uh, basically, I took a little bit of money from everybody and tried to convince them that they um, they hadn't been robbed. Uh, I, I did go looking for money from commissioners in, initially, and basically because there was nothing extant, there was nothing existing, it was just an idea written on paper that was never going to happen. Um, I did get a little bit of money from underspend, a little bit of money from clinical trial income, a very little bit of money from the Health Innovation Network to pay for the actual assays, a lot of goodwill um, from uh, from around the trust, and then bargaining with providers brought down some of the costs. Um, and now, of course, we're working with industry and others to try and scale this uh, across various sites across the UK that are not currently using CSF. And just uh, just to tell you what I learned dealing with, you know, how do you manipulate a massive bureaucracy or get around a massive bureaucracy to get get something better for your patients? I think finding the right people in the organization is very important. Um, channeling your frustration with your clinical service into a service improvement is a, is a really good cure for burnout if that's a risk for you. Um, you must be passionate about these things in order to get people on board. Uh, simply present the facts won't work. You need to twist some arms. And sometimes it's easier to beg forgiveness than ask permission. Um, it, they'll believe you when it's done. If if you get something up and running uh, with the governance being nice and tight around it, then it's very difficult for them to take that safest service away. Um, and perfect is the enemy of of good enough. Um, don't don't try and make a perfect service. Just try and make something that's 
that's good enough. Um, John talked a little bit about the pre-analytical pathway. My advice is just to read his paper um, on the pre-analytical pathway and then look for help. So um, Miles Chapman in the lab in UCLH would be very, very happy to give you advice on um, how to uh, uh, make sure that your sample is ready to be analyzed and the variability is low. Uh, they also have a handbook available if that's where you're shipping it. We're very hopeful that the Roche Alexis system will be up and running quite soon in Manchester and that we'll be able to take fresh samples rather than frozen samples, uh, removing the need for a minus 80 freezer and, and uh, pipetting and other things. So 30 people have had CSF-based diagnoses since April in 2023 in the Greater Manchester Mental Health Trust. I can tell you as a clinician of nearly 20 years, it's a, an absolute game changer in terms of diagnosis. Um, to be able to tell people at the mild cognitive impairment stage that it is the disease or it is not the disease that they fear um, is, a, is, a very, is a qualitatively different experience as a doctor. There's now a queue of trainees to be trained in the actual procedure of lumbar puncture. Um, and the patient experience is absolutely excellent. So the average discomfort out of 10, 10 being childbirth or what they imagine childbirth to be, um, and zero being no discomfort at all, we have an average discomfort of about one. Um, people are asked about headache and, and we've not had any post lumbar puncture headaches. Um, and people are followed up at 48 hours to find out what their level of discomfort and, and headache has been over the succeeding 48 hours. And again, um, their advice to other people uh, um, is that they should go have, have, ahead and have it done. So all 30 people would recommend that in the right hands, people should have their, their CSF done. So the next steps we're looking at are scaling to the whole trust. Because currently this is based on three memory clinics within a, a large trust in Greater Manchester, and then scaling to the whole region, about which I have uh, some trepidation. So uh, 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 tips are welcome. Any advice you have is very, very welcome. Um, and uh, the monkey on the bicycle is meant to re represent the fact that, yes, I know it's unusual that psychiatrists stick needles in people, but actually um, uh, I just wanted to demonstrate that it was possible and that nobody had any excuse for not doing it. Um, there might be alternative routes, though, and you don't, you don't have to necessarily um, uh, be the needle monkey yourself. Um, if you have a big functioning acute trust next door and a really good working relationship with neurology like Chinesi Avenso does in Wales, um, and at least one eager neurology trainee somewhere to do the procedure, maybe that's your compromise. Maybe that's your, your um, good enough in terms of, the, of, of getting it up and running. Um, maybe neurology locally are just uh, twiddling their thumbs and they decide they want to set up the LP clinic and any putative treatment center. I think that's unlikely given what, what I know about neurology's capacity, but it's possible and you could ask, if, especially if you're beside a you big university center. And then geriatricians are interested. So um, I know that I spoke to Duncan Alston in Hellingdon a couple of weeks ago, um, who has done this essentially off his own, but having trained under John in, in UCL. And so um, people are who, who have trained in big university centers will sometimes bring this out to wherever they're doing it to. Um, and that's, you know, we're, we're, like, like us, he's doing a limited clinic two cases a week, but with a view to scaling it in the new year. And I, I think probably we have some infrastructure here if we need to treat people with disease modifying therapeutics. Um, that we need to uh, think about harnessing because uh, we know that nobody's going to build us new hospitals. Um, yeah, so I, I think we need to reassess a little bit what we are. Um, uh, we do electroconvulsive therapy. We regularly rely on the results of ECGs for pre prescribing decisions, not just in old age psychiatry, but in the rest of psychiatry. Um, and this this sort of um, thing that follows us around that we're not proper doctors and we shouldn't be doing procedures. I think that needs to go away really rather quickly. Um, it's our responsibility. Actually, we see the vast majority of the patients who are going to benefit from DMTs or might benefit from DMTs and would definitely benefit from the diagnostics. Um, and to be honest, we've been kind of fairly apathetic about getting this up and running um, as, as a profession. So I think um, it is up to us to make something happen now. Um, and we really, I, I, I rail against this idea that we're, we have such low resources in the mental health trusts that we can't do anything about it because Rick, it's kind of our fault. I mean, it's not totally our fault, but you know, we did play into this idea that we could do it on a wing and a prayer, um, and that may have been true in the 1990s and the and the early 2000s, but it certainly isn't anymore. I think we do our patients a disservice by by continuing to assume that. Okay, Bob, hope that was controversial enough. Thank you, Ross. No, that was that's very good. I like the. The user word wallflower. 
that's really good. Um, no, um, I think um, the theme uh, seems to be this kind of, you know, sort of the fact that the blood brain, uh, blood blood biomarkers are on their way. And if the sensitivity and specificity isn't any different, then it's going to be very difficult to persuade anyone to set up a LB services. So just wonder, John, if you can touch and of course, Ross can sort of, you know, chip in in there as well. I think that's been the main theme really in the in the QA. Thank you. I mean, I think the blood-based biomarker field is extremely exciting. Um, it is going to be a little while away before we have the evidence needed to get these out, these tests out um, into um, memory clinics. Uh, Ross and others and myself are, are putting together plans and bids to be able to do this, but it is going to be a little bit of time. And under that three, the two cut point model that I proposed, we're still going to have 20 to 25% of people with a grey zone who probably are going to need to go and have a definitive test. We've done some modelling with the London School of Economics when we didn't have blood tests, whether it's going to be amyloid PET or CSF, if we're going to roll out blood, um, new disease modifying therapies. It has to be CSF with a few, uh, with some availability of amyloid PET um, as well. So I think the answer is, we can always sit and wait for the next technology to come. I think the other technology is coming, but I think there's not an excuse for not doing it now. And as Ross said, in many ways, it's it's slightly criminal. And also, this goes for neurology practices as well, um, is that um, we've had nice guidance for several years and um, we've sat on our hands. And the same goes for neurology. And, you know, Ross particularly has done an amazing job in showing how that this is this is all doable. The one thing I would add is that all the, I run a weekly lumbar puncture clinic where we do a couple of patients a week. Ours are all done by a trained consultant nurse now. Um, initially, we had doctors on hand to do that. When she's away, we struggle to get our junior doctors to do it as well because you train the nurses up well as and they and she just does all of them. Um, also, it's a wonderful opportunity to get people involved in research. We can send everybody who comes in for research everyone says yes when we take off another 20 mils of csf there's no evidence that increased volume increases your headache risk sudden and take blood off suddenly you're a research center um and then you can start doing uh, additional things as well so it's a real it's it's a it's a gateway drug um into research thank you brilliant no and there's another question here about um sort of how you analyze samples the transportation and and where, where they're analyzed it's all at UCL, is that right at the moment? Or, so, so Miles Chapman's lab at, at UCLH is the, the place that's currently running the Fuji assays. Um, and the, the Fuji assays are CE marked, so they're, they're ready for clinic. And it gives you this nice B to 42, B to 40 ratio, P to 181. And um, then there's a separate sort of ELISA for, um, for a neurofilm at light. So, um, so that means the samples have to be at minus 80. It means you, you, if you're sending them from around the country, you have to batch the samples, really, unless you want to spend an extra £250 every sample. And so you're likely to have a sort of need somewhere to store them, etc. So you send them, you send them at minus 80. Is that right? You have to transport yeah. them at that. Yeah. 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 Uh, but there are so some you can very see that exciting. There are some very exciting new technologies. So there's now something called BioFreeze, which is a new method of being able to send them through the post again. One of the issues is when there's relatively few people sending them, then they go through the major centres as soon as you do what Ross has done and take them out, out of those major centres. But there are 108 centres around the country sending labs. So again, if Ross says, Ross says, if you, uh, you, sh you should not have a, a, a big laboratory too far away from you that can handle those, those samples. And in due course, again, the strength in numbers, when there's enough, at the moment it's all done in one reference laboratory, but the technology is available in biochemistry labs around the country. And so once yeah. we have the sufficient volume, it will be done locally and then we'll have what already happens at Queen Square, which is part of an international reference program so that we keep the, the cut points and everything standardised as well, which is also important. Yeah, thank you. Lots of really positive comments as well coming in, Ross, about how inspiring and your, your work has been. Um, did you did you think about a uh, question about linking with neurology at one point or? or yeah, so you know? I mean, uh, Tobias has been very helpful. Um, they set up the the um, this, this training in Salford. Um, they got me the, I mean, Tobias drove through and got, got the honorary contract so that I could lurk twice a week for a little while. Um, mm -hmm. 
Uh, but the fact was that during COVID, their their service got halved, and um, their day hospital got halved in in okay. floor uh, size, and okay. they just just would not have the the resource. And that's that is going to be a common um, a response, I think, from neurology. We'd yeah. love to help, but actually, we we, okay. we just don't have the room. Oh, lovely. Well, I think we're going to finish up hitting the five o'clock mark very soon. So just really big thank you to you both today, John and Ross. Brilliant, brilliant talks, really inspiring. We've had sort of news from the press today. We've had news about future of old age psychiatrists doing LPs, etc. So th thank so you relevant. so much. Thank you so, so much. And we'll thank be so recording this session. Too. It'll be available in due course. So thank you. Thank you, everybody. I'm sorry we haven't been able to answer all the, all the questions. All Thanks the very much. Thanks. Take care, everybody. Thank you for joining, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Thank you, John. It's fantastic.